Welcome to the Moonshot Podcast, the podcast where we explore business growth, inspire innovative marketing strategies, and explore the world of company culture. Now, here are your hosts, serial entrepreneurs and best-selling authors, James Philip Arbuckle and Kane Carpenter. You know, I'm flipping through the comments for this episode, and what do you think the reoccurring theme is? J. Cal not being there. It's, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's, so I didn't look at the comments first. I, I caught this episode, I was up at, I don't know, four or five that morning, getting coffee ready, refresh uh, YouTube, and I see it, the uh, episode dropped. So I was like, you know, screw it. I'm just going to play it right now while I'm getting ready for the day. And uh, so, you know, the, the comments, I don't know if you all YouTube works, but a lot of times comments don't show up right away. Have you noticed that? Mm-hmm. Yep. So there, there wasn't really any comments yet. So I get through the episode and then I reload the comments. And I'm thinking at that time, wow, this was a really peaceful episode. I felt like everyone got to say what they wanted to say. And there wasn't mass interruptions. And it was very smooth and Freeberg just killed it. And then what do you think the comments said? <laughs> Friedberg killed it. What a smooth, co- <laughs> what a smooth conversation. <laughs> yeah, Andre, like I, I'm looking at the comments um, right now. It's it's really nice when the moderator doesn't interject. Well done, Friedberg. Um, such a peaceful episode. Not no moderator needed. This was a real conversation. What an enjoyable episode. Um, over and over and over again. Um, Best episode to listen to in a long time. Free flowing, no flexing. Actually re- relaxing to listen to. Freeberg is spot on. I love this passion on AI. Um, oh, here's an interesting comment, and I do remember something that triggered this thought, Kane. It says uh, Elon once said that law should have an expiration date and then should be voted on for continuing the law again with an expiration date. Did you catch any part of that during the episode? Ooh, I I don't remember. But do you have a do you have a point to for it? I do remember listening to something they said that day, that, that that Friday morning it came out, and I think once before you and I talked about years ago. I'm thinking pre-COVID, where I said I feel like the U.S. has too many laws on the books and. uh I'm doing this thing with my father right now where I'm, uh, I'm working on another book about where I grew up. It's, it's, a, it's fiction, but it's crime-related because I grew up just south of Detroit and had family in Detroit down by the bridge, and my father grew up down there. So we're kind of doing this thing of like we're going back down to where we grew up, and he's you know, talking about all these places, and sometimes he'll say, like, well, this used to be all dirt road, and... You could you could drive a little bit faster, and there was no lights and stop signs, and the cops would leave you alone. And when you hear someone talk about the 50s and 60s, you realize they were so much more free. Um, that's not the first time I heard an old-timer talk like that. So I think one time I looked up, and not like quote-unquote laws, but laws, rules, regulations. There's over 100,000 games. And then you start looking at state, city, county you add all these up and you literally can't do anything anymore without the possibility of getting a penalty or a civil fine or going to jail it's we have so many laws and rules and regulations you can't even breathe anymore so there was something that they discussed i don't fully remember it but obviously based on that comment they did talk about it Um, i don't know how you feel about that it's just sometimes i feel like you're living with a straight jacket on because there's so many damn laws anymore. I had no idea that there were that many. So that that's kind of mind blowing. Um, granted, I don't really think about this stuff too often. So, I mean, you know, like the, I'm pretty good at staying within the realms of the laws. I'd say <laughs> I don't really feel the pressure, but I don't think about it that often. I mean, it sounds like you would make a terrible criminal. <laughs> <laughs> oh man so what else did uh did they talk about here well the episode started with with 
the guys, of course, reflecting on on the Middle East and, and Ukraine and, and sex. I think you have a you you've probably got a good reflection on this, knowing you. But um, it sounded like sex was was kind of positioning himself as these things need to come to an end, which was interesting, you know, considering the rhetoric in the media, at least, uh, you know, around this stuff. So do you remember that part? And do you have a thought on it? I do. And I, I don't want to put words in the guy's mouth because I, there's times I remember everything in great detail with this photogenic memory. And then there's other times it's, man, I'm screwing this all up right now. Um, but I, I want to say over the, the last six, 12 months, let's say that the reoccurring theme with him was let's get, let's put an end to this thing. Like where's the off ramp? And I'm not saying he's like anti Zelensky. It's just that I think Sachs probably more than the other three felt like there was no, there's no winning this war. And that maybe it was delusional to think that Ukraine was going to take back all the land. And I, I, there's a, I don't know how they're trying to paint him in that light, but that's kind of been his general feeling of let's figure out how to negotiate an ending. You're probably going to lose some land. You're not going to like it, but everyone stops dying. And I'm not saying he said that exactly, but it kind of felt like the reoccurring theme where I, I man, I feel even from our own government sometimes, that they just don't want this war to slow down. And we're going to keep feeding them military um, goods and money. And I get you're weakening Russia, but how do you end something that the people who are feeling it, they just want, they're, they're going to keep pouring kerosene on the fire, right? Where I felt like Sachs is like, stop the flow of kerosene. So I don't... I don't know. It's one of those things where you don't know who's right or wrong, how the history books are going to rewrite this. Who knows? It's just, in general, war sucks, and you would like to try to put an end to it as soon as possible. You you think? I mean, not to sound, you know, like unsympathetic or, or whatever, but the, um, I think it's very interesting the way that this second conflict in the Middle East now has, uh, like, w what that has meant for the way that we view the Ukraine conflict. Because I think when it was just the Ukraine conflict that was taking up all the oxygen in the room, we thought, you know, that was, you know, that was, that was it, right? That was the, that was as bad as it could get. And then I feel like this, this last one is, is just kind of taking it to a different level. And so we're now, I think societally looking at the Ukraine thing as like a, is that even worth doing anymore? I don't know if you feel the same way, but it's just been an interesting juxtaposition or what, whatever you want to call it um, to see the two next to each other. Um, Cause they seem like different magnitudes on there, but maybe I, that's my uninformed opinion magnitudes with multiple multitudes I, I don't know like <laughs> it's you get in these conversations sometimes and it's you know at some point you're you're focused on your your own life and your own family and am i really paying attention to what's going on in the other 190 something countries in the world down to great detail and geopolitics no i'm not i just not enough time in the day to do all that right um and there's times like people will test you on that. And it's like, do I really know exactly the ins and outs of what's going on in, in Russia versus Ukraine? No, I, I don't. That's not my specialty. I know that I'm going to end up on the hook for paying for quite a bit of this. Um, I, I think I remember reading that we said we would back Ukraine. That was part of the reason why they gave up their nuclear weapons. So I, we got to keep our word and... So I don't, I don't really feel a certain type of way other than like war sucks and, and it would be cool if we could find an off ramp if possible. Um, and then, you know, what's going on in the Middle East is a whole other, you know, you go reading these comments out there and it, you almost get attacked if you don't really know all the ins and outs of it. And it's like, man, it's, there's people who have like a dog in the fight and those that don't. And, now it's 
you know, the whole emphasis and even in the news has shifted over to the Middle East because this seems for many reasons, right? What happened, where it's going, the that doesn't seem like there's any de escalation in the Middle East right now. You almost I mean, how much do you even see about Ukraine in the news right now? I uh I'm trying to think of, like, because Zelensky almost became the celebrity. Now, you can disagree. It doesn't matter. Agree. You know, he's, he kind of got adopted by Hollywood. He's getting airtime and, you know, on US TV with our government. I think he got airtime in Canada. They're getting billions, not billions, hundred, two hundred billions of dollars of, like, money and, and military goods getting pumped into their, do you think Zelensky actually wants this thing to end? That's an interesting question. Yeah. And like, this is the the most powerful he's ever felt in his life. And he knows once this ends, then the, the fame, the celebrity, the money, the weapons, this rise to power is also going to fade. And it's like, so we have a U.S. government that it sounds like we don't want an off-ramp. You have, you know, a president... That, you know, there there is something special about being a wartime president. And it's, I'm sure he doesn't want to lose his land, but to get this much money and power pumped into you all of a sudden, right? Do you want it to end? It's misaligned incentives, as you say sometimes. I uh, completely agree. And uh, it's power corrupts. It's, it's all those things, isn't it? Uh, I hadn't thought, I mean, that's a really interesting point. That's a really interesting point. And then I'm also wondering, right, as someone that, you know, has to pay out a large tax bill every year, you know, 100, 150, 200 billion dollars. We know you, I want to say Ukraine was up there on, on top of countries of corruption. And I'm thinking, you know, even in the U.S., they talk about anywhere from 10% to 40% of the money we spend here is corrupt. So how much, if we sent $100 billion to the Ukraine, how much do you, you think that's getting siphoned off along the way, kickbacks, things that are getting, money's getting moved around the world? Like, is it is it 20%? Is it $20 billion for every $100 billion? Like, What's an accurate number, do you think? there? Because, can you realize, I'm, even when you run a company, when you're at $10 million to, to, trying to manage a budget and track down where all the money's going, $10 million to $100 million is so drastic, right? And then a billion dollars in spend? You could easily spend, you know, an extra $50,000 on, you know, inventory shrink that someone's been stealing from you, not notice it, because it's, What's fifty thousand on a billion? So out of a hundred billion or two hundred billion during the the middle of a war in Ukraine, how much of that's going missing? Do you think? That's scary to think about. I get, the question that comes to my mind is like how 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 do we stand in the way of some of this money being siphoned off so it hits us in the head? You know, like uh, yeah, put I'd a like helmet on. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you need one of those iron worker helmets right now because and now it's you know this middle east thing doesn't seem like it's slowing down and uh you know to quote the famous janet yellen uh didn't i mean i maybe i'm ad-libbing here but didn't she say we we can afford to fight two wars at the same time because the economy's so strong yes i think that's verbatim <laughs> it might be not it's it could be i'm just Joking. ad-libbing here but yeah it's, yeah and it's I, I saw a funny meme one day. I told you about it. And uh, I, in my Instagram, I created this channel called Funny Stuff, and I'll dump. I'll find the, the funniest thing I see on Instagram once a day, I'll dump it out to that channel. And it's like, it helps my engagement because Instagram sucks anymore trying to keep engagement up. And this meme said, name another country that... um like sends like hundreds of billions of dollars overseas and then taxes their citizens to death. <laughs> and then, you know, it's, we're number one at that, right? It's, we will fund these wars all over the place and then we just get the tax bill and we're supposed to smile and 
say thank you. Yeah, it'd be funny if it wasn't so true. Goodness. But it's funny because it is true, right? It's, yeah. it gets nothing yeah. more true. Um, and then I got just, I'm, I'm concerned with the Middle East thing because I don't, I, I talked before in another episode about trying to see around two corners at the same time. Like seeing around one corner is hard. And I feel like this is one of those instances where you have to see around two corners. And I feel like they they flew in with the you know parachutes and and butchered people to and to elicit a certain response that they knew would come from Israel and the rest of the world. And then Israel's response was going to kind of rile up a whole community or, or many other countries. And it's like I just felt like that's only part of the plan, and we're moving more ships and. I, I just don't know. There's always an end game, right? I, I don't think this is like, hey, we're going to do this. I don't know. I, I'm concerned this thing is not going to slow down. And then maybe, again, like Ukraine, do we want it to slow down? The, the, I mean, I, I've, I echo your point about the fear. Remember early days of the Ukraine conflict? Like, there was chitter-chatter about World War Three, but that I mean, that pales in comparison to the contagion that you could, I mean, even me as somebody who's pretty uninformed about, you know, the, the, I will call it geopolitics or whatever, can see the second, third order effect of the, the Middle East conflict and how that would spread and, and uh, pull a lot of different players in, like bigger players. Um, so it is, it is super concerning. Uh, again, I, I, to me, I mean, conflict is bad, of course, uh, anywhere. But it's just, it, I think you made this point last week or, or maybe in our own conversations, James, but this does feel different and it does seem to continue to feel different. And it was just on the Wall Street Journal before we hopped on this this recording and uh, it, it was saying that like the the Israelis were walking into Gaza City or something. Like it just the, the, the line keeps getting further and further, further in terms of like what is being allowed by the international community as the, you know, as the response to what happened to, to Israel. It, it just seems just kind of wild to me, but, and, and, but more than wild, it, it's, it's just concerning. Hey, I was just, I mean, uninformed is a good, like the, the greatest, the most thing I'm informed about is, you know, what's on the special menu at my favorite Mexican place for lunch tomorrow. <laughs> it's, it's hard enough. I got, you know, companies in five States. You're trying to hold all this stuff together. My dad's got doctor appointments. And do I have time to really dig into two wars? Like I, I do want to try to get educated. You go read. And then it's like, well, then there's like sourced bias. Well, um, what am I reading? If I go to one website, it says this, I go to another website. It says that. I have to read both websites, maybe go read some comments, and then somewhere in there, try to synthesize all that data to find the truth. And it's like, man, it's it's a hell of a mess, right? And it's tough to comment on sometimes, because you start developing thoughts, and then you get some new news, and those thoughts you feel aren't right. And But it just it doesn't... If you see what's going on, I don't know how anyone feels good. You technically have two wars going on right now. And there's probably some other bad actors out there that we don't even know about. And you hope we get things under control. But as of today, it just doesn't feel that way. And it is that contagion aspect is if they think America's weak right now, we're so busy fighting with ourselves and trying to fix our own problems. Is this not the best time to go start shit? It's going to find out. I just, um, I want to open up the news site one morning and say, okay, someone's trying to put the world on a better path. And as of today, I don't feel that way. Yeah, I agree. I agree. But something we're more informed about, at least <laughs> wrong person to talk to deal politics. I don't know. I don't know. Crap. Um, but Q4 market rally, a lot of people are expecting Q4 to be bad. But we're running back up again. 
Why do you think that is? I mean, Shamath mentioned that it was, what, the end of the mutual fund cycle or something. They they can't sit on cash. So this is the, I, I don't even fully understand that market. If someone's um, buying mutual funds or doing it for me, I'm not out buying mutual funds. Um, but you could say that every year then, right? This isn't a new thing. So are you telling me every November it went up? I don't think that's true. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that either. But I guess it also depends on how much cash is on the sideline. If it is tax loss harvesting, maybe in prior years where the market is going bottom left, top right, then there isn't the need to tax loss harvest, then you wouldn't have that cash infusion, if this is true. I know there's a lot of cash on the sidelines. I mean, Buffett's at $158 billion right now, which that, that in itself is not... It, is it the canary in the coal mine or, or some, something they say? But the, if he's sitting on that much cash, it, it is for a reason. You're either, you think something's going to crash. You think things are extremely overvalued, right? There, there's multiple reasons why you do that. But to not put that money to work, why, right? So are mutual funds sitting on a bunch of cash? I don't know. Um, and then I think on the tax loss, if I recall anyways, you can't, you can't sell and then buy again within what thirty or sixty days or something. There's some rule to that. You know, you wouldn't sell October thirty first and then you know take the loss and then rebuy it in November. You could buy a different security. And uh, obviously, I'm not a financial advisor. I, just, I thought there was some rule there that you had to wait a while. Yeah, great point. Um, I hadn't thought of that. Yep. It's. An interesting prospect if they were sitting on a bunch of cash. I just, you know, some of the earnings came out maybe better than expected, but you had a thought on that. You were saying that that's because they revised down. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, last few quarters, people, companies have been revising down. The people are revising down even now, right? Like the great earnings, but revising down, which is why you're not really seeing the market rip, I think, like cra- like really uh, crazy. Um. But I do think another thing, I mean, if we're going to kind of see around a couple of corners here, you, the the amount of layoffs that are happening right now probably mean that a quarter or two from now, you're going to see good, like good EPS again, uh, because that that cost is off the off the books. So, you know, I just lots of games being played, I suppose, to make sure that EPS is always in a good spot. But just I, it's a funny time, but yeah, I, I I can see, and also we had the 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 rates pause, right? So is the market kind of looking at that and saying, okay, let's uh, maybe, maybe things are are gonna go in our favor for a little bit? I don't know, I don't know. I mean, no, we talked about there's a couple of companies that were looking to offload in the next few years and the, the effect of interest rates on multiples, and I could see where all right now if the pivot's gonna begin. You know, you're going to revalue these stocks and you could get a little excited and you get ahead of yourself and then we got a little rally. Um, you know, we know firsthand on uh, one of the companies we're involved in, the outplays in business, which you know, helps displace workers get back to work faster. Last week was the greatest week I think we've ever had in since probably 2008 in terms of inbound sales, correct? Correct. Yep. So it's all right. You see that now, and, and typically Q1 is when we see a, a lot of the layoffs. So we're not even in the Q1 yet, and we're we're hitting the rev limiter, and that that is gonna that does show up on the balance sheet later on. But you can trim the headcount, which for many companies is their greatest cost. But if the demand softens with it, is it gonna be as pretty as you think it is? Mm, that's that's actually a really valid point. I guess they just got to cut faster than they think growth will slow or sales will slow. Yeah, they're, they're going to have to probably cut more than... I mean, we just saw today in the news that Citibank was talking about doing a heavy 10% trim on staff. So I, I think... I, I don't know if... Uh, I, I think in the last... I mean, what's the average layoff we've seen? 6 7%, something like that. Between, Between call it five and twelve, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's you know whatever. On average, seven and a half, eight percent layoff, and 
some of those companies were were smaller. I mean, you know, layoffs at a point where you don't have to do a warn notice at what fifty. You got to do a warn notice at fifty, I think, depending on the state. I think it's yeah. Don't quote us on that, but it's close. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's uh, I don't know all the state laws and all that stuff, but just you know, roughly. So you know, we know there's some of the layoffs where you know 10, 15, 20, 25 people, and then you're starting to see some of the bigger reductions in force or what they call rifts, where it's you know 100, 200 people, and uh. I still think for co- you know companies that are ten, twenty, thirty thousand people, Kane, that's still using a scalpel. And I don't, we we have not reached the machete layoffs yet. And I think they were trying to do some finite trimming, but I, I still have not seen where they've really started to do the five hundred thousand, two thousand type of layoffs. And if demand softens greatly, which on CNBC today there was something they pulled companies, supply chain, blah blah they're they're planning on or they're expecting this christmas to have softer demand so i think they've been very very precise with their layoffs in the last like 18 months we saw but i'm concerned that maybe q1 q2 you're going to start seeing these companies like citibank just mentioned 10 percent of, of a company that size we might see that really uptick and that is going to have an effect on things. You've talked about this before, but at some point there won't, there won't be, you know how over the last call it 18 months, there's been, you know, 1.7, 1.8 jobs per, per uh, open jobs per worker or per unemployed person. I forget the exact stat, but um, at some point that'll soften to where, the 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 people that are laid off by these companies won't have another home that's so easy? Like, what do you foresee then? Well, look, man, I I tell this story a lot to young entrepreneurs. I just did it, you know, I don't know, three weeks ago or something. I met up with a group and I was trying to, I got invited in to just give them the insights of the daily life of an entrepreneur and um, you know, I, hell, you think I, I started a hundred, you know, businesses in my lifetime probably. Um, but in that 20, 25 years game, like, you know, the story, you know, I've, I've been through three recessions. I just got my first big business going. And then like 2000, 2001 hit, you just get it going again, 2000, you know, seven, 2008 hits very slow climb out of that one, by the way. And then God, we were just blazing across multiple companies, 2019 COVID hits. And uh, when you look at that, you're trying to like think of where we're going in the next 24 months, right? Yeah, yeah. I just, you know, the the other the other flip side of of that is is I I hope that in reflection, like if we reflect on the COVID period. I always bring up Peloton as the case study because because that number always sticks in my head in terms of like their headcount growth uh, during that small period of time. But hopefully, what this is a signal of these layoffs recently is a little bit more discipline around workforce management, if that's what you want to call it. To where companies now understand that this isn't a free money environment. You know, rates have an impact on on your ability to to get cash, and it, it impacts people's pockets probably more profoundly than people realize and companies don't go on these massive hiring sprees and they're better about pruning and uh, get making sure that their workforce is better over time um, so that we don't see 10 percent, and instead it's more like half a percent of your workforce in in this kind of cycle throughout a year Uh, uh, just a kind of random thought there in terms of the health of a like what, what it means to be a healthy workforce and what active managers have to do to make sure that that stays on track. Yeah, I mean, you know, going back, you know, you asked a question about all these people getting laid off and how's that changed things. And as I'm talking about these recessions, as you had those, you know, two bubbles, you know, 2000, 2001, 2008. And then you had these crazy employment markets and then, you know, you don't even need a resume to get a job. And then the market crashes. And the dynamic changes, it goes from a candidate-driven market to a company-driven market where, you know, the candidate used to just get away with whatever they wanted. They could name their price, and now it's going to go back the other way where the company is going to be able to make the demands. And 
I think what's I think one thing that's kind of concerning. Unfortunately, I, I I know a lot of people that did this. I get the calls from business acquaintances that say, "Hey, talk to my kids." And the problem is their kids, you know, since COVID happened, have switched jobs three or four times, um, trying to get that quick pay bump. And I I try telling them it's like, look, man, everyone I know that you can get wealthy working for somebody else. It's this fallacy to think that you have to be an entrepreneur and the, you know, social media, media in general will program you to think like, oh, you're just making somebody else rich. And like, no, there's many of the same opportunities that you have as an entrepreneur you have working for somebody else. It's just how, how do you maximize those? And then you put yourself in the position to maximize that opportunity. And you can't maximize that opportunity when you're changing jobs every nine months. And there's a couple funny things. I, I jump on TikTok and I don't love the platform, but if you get a pulse of what is, are people thinking, you know, you'll see a lot of people right now saying, Hey, I got laid off six months ago and I, I applied to 250 jobs and no one's calling me back. And there'll be 10,000 comments, Kane, okay? But one person will finally chime in and go, you know, do you think it's possible that because of your tenure, no one wants to hire you right now? And I, I've argued with so many people about this because this is what I hear in the boardroom. This is what I hear from executives, from the executive hiring committees that are on the board of large companies. Like, I never hear them get excited for a job hopper, right? And then you look at social media and it's they pressure you to job hop and change jobs and screw the company. So when you say, you know, these people are getting laid off and all of a sudden this hot job market changes instead of two jobs for every person, it's hard for one person to get a job. Companies get very picky, Kane. This was 2009 to about 2015, okay? They're looking at what college you went to. They're looking at the companies you worked for. They're looking at your tenure. And there's so many candidates now because it's, it's now a, a company-driven market. They don't have to settle for the person that changes jobs every nine months. And I, I watched a, a funny video this morning. And it's funny in the sense that it's, it's not funny. It made me laugh because it's hard to get people to think this way. But they said one of the number one things you have to learn to succeed in anything, whether it's sports, business, name it, it was playing the long game. And our culture now is so focused on this short game that we won't even look past tomorrow anymore. And five years later, it ends up costing you a hell of a lot. And I'm sure you've seen this where it's difficult to get people to play the long game anymore. Oh, my God. It, I mean, I, I point to, I mean, short answer, yes. I point to our obsession with social media and things as the as the catalyst, right? Like uh, our inability to just uh, to to not chase quick dopamine hits, right? That little pay bump every six months that you you, you were able to get eighteen twenty four months ago. I get it, but like in a world where that doesn't exist, people are going to really struggle. But the, I guess the greater point that I think about as you were saying that, James, is there is always a place for making good decisions about your career, about, you know, the positions that you put yourself in. And uh, even though in like the very short term, call it the last 18, 24 months in, in the kind of COVID era, uh, era uh, it, f it didn't feel like it was wise to make the rational decision, right? It was, it, it would have been easy to, for everybody to go chase, you know, a new job every six months because that's what it seemed like was the right thing to do then i think this is proving over a long enough curve time horizon uh that making good choices is probably the right always the right thing to do so yeah i'm, I'm i absolutely agree i don't know how you change it you know that's the media and it's not it's i always call it the narrative it's not just social media though it's it's everywhere you go you're kind of encouraged to do these things. And it's, uh, you know, I talk about that company upward we started and so much of that development of that company was based on analyzing successful people. You know, the people that I'm having dinner with that, you know, they're not billionaires, but maybe everyone at the table together is a hundred million dollars. And 
they all sound the same, you know, hard work, sacrifice, dedication, you know, seeking deep mentorship. Um, they all sound the same and it all worked for them. And I was trying to give someone an example recently of, uh, the five non entrepreneur people I know that are, that I consider wealthy. They all stuck around their company for seven, 10, 15 years, maybe even 20 years. They helped build something. They climbed their way to the top to like CEO or something. And I asked them, it's like, well, do you remember that person, you know, you, when you were associate at the consulting company, like, where are some of your friends now? Are they CEOs now? Okay. And the answer is typically no. And maybe at that point in time, their peer jumped somewhere and got 20 grand more, but they eventually end up getting left in the dust. And I'm not saying you stay somewhere forever, but sometimes you do. You ever look at how many like CEOs have climbed their way up to the top? And you say it's really hard to get this like domain expertise if you never stick around anywhere long enough to get good at something. I'll try and make a point here and see if the math works out. But over the course of a career, James, if you were to jump uh, a couple times, or if you were to if you were to job hop, how many do you think is reasonable? How many job hops do you think is reasonable over the course of a successful career? See, that's hard to answer because I don't really look at. I'm always looking at opportunity and what I'm learning. There's been many times when I was consulting that I would go in early for two hours, not getting paid just to learn. So there's more value in learning than whatever hourly rate they would have gave you. And I present that question to people in college right now, and they, they actually get pissed. But that's a whole other conversation. I go, you know, look, if Google calls you up right now and says, come intern for Google this summer, but we're not paying you, would you do it? What do you think the response is most of the time, Kane? Uh, no way. No way. They should pay me another greedy corporation. Let, let's just say everything you're saying is true. Let's say they're taking advantage of you. Let's say they're getting free labor. Let's just say all the things you're saying are 100% true. Do you not believe those three months and what you could learn if you maximized it at Google, would that be more valuable on your resume than whatever they would have paid you per hour? And it's hard to get, no one wants to believe that anymore. Now, Kane, if someone wants you to come chase coffee all day, it's a waste of your goddamn time. But imagine being able to put Google on your resume as an internship and how many doors that's going to open for you at graduation time. Yeah. So that, that's, to me, it's, this is a very complex conversation. Um, you know, sometimes you only stick around three years. You maximize what you can get from this place and you move on. But the next time, maybe it's 15 years. So I don't know. It could be three or four times in a career, Kane. It could be eight. I, I can't say that like in a finite number. Mm, yeah. Um, well, the only point I was poorly trying to make was uh, we. it's the idea that we underestimate, you know, like that saying, we underestimate what we can achieve in, in a, or we overestimate what we can achieve in a short amount of time and under, underestimate what we can achieve in a long amount of, in a, a long time. I think that's, that's the same goes something like that. But if you think over, you know, 15 years is a long time. And if I said to, you know, to a college age kid now, you know, what could you imagine yourself staying at a company for 15 years? The answer would probably be no. Right. Um, but 15 years is a long time. You can develop quite a lot of domain expertise over 15 years. And if you think over the course of a career from the time you're 22 to, to when you're 67 or say, you know, you've got three 15 year periods there. So even if you switch jobs three times, two times, um, you have the ability, I don't really know what the point I'm trying to make here, but you have the ability to really, if you just stick with something, you can, you can achieve quite a bit. Um, and you still have, you know, if you have to move companies once or twice in your career, you can still be loyal, right? You, it, it, when you're 25, it seems like the whole world is, you have to achieve everything at 25, and it's just not the case. I, I'm just, I guess, going back to the original point is that there is so much value in playing the long game. And to your point, most successful people that I know in my circle, which, you know, different fields, different things like that, everyone plays the long game. Everyone plays the long game. And it's one of those things that it's my whole life. I tend to, I just had this conversation with my uh, personal trainer today. I was big into like powerlifting and bodybuilding back in the day. And we were talking about where do you seek advice from? 
And I was like, look, man, it's a, a, I was competitive in this stuff. I, I don't even need a trainer. I enjoy one. And it's, you look at the advice from what you get, say from TikTok today about fitness and no, I, I'm taking the advice from the people that won the trophies. And it's the same way, like in financial advice, it's, I'm not typically interested in, okay, and if, when I started getting money when I was like 19 and 20 in the tech world, if I would have went back home and asked those people on how to manage my money, I would, I would be living in a trailer right now, Kane. <laughs> I, I, I had to go seek out the, you know, I, I sought out a mentor that, you know, worked at Honeywell that I knew through consulting. He's probably in his sixties and a uh, very contrarian investor. And, you know, back then was moving, you know, hundred thousand dollar CDs around at 6% and all the time. And, I was like, I got a lot of my financial advice from the guy that had five or six million dollars in the bank. Not from the person who was living check to check buying stuff on payment plans on Finger Hut. Um, it's like we get we don't want to go look at the people who've done it and they're successful and follow their advice. Not like TikTok, for example. And how, how many people have you seen job hop every year until they became CEO? No, I, I don't think I've ever seen it. How long has Jamie Dimon been at, been at Chase? Uh, I don't know the exact number, but it's, he's been there a long time. Uh, in the mid-2000s? Something like that? There's a lot of people that you can go make that story for. And I, uh... Anyways, you know, the, you, if you're in a bad situation, you change jobs. If you are severely underpaid, you, you change jobs. Sometimes you will be underpaid, but you're learning a lot, you stay. But there's just these times that it's like, I think people grossly underestimate how much money you're going to make between 40 and 60. And we're in this race to get somewhere as fast as possible. And you don't realize how hard it is to get a job and stay employed after 40 with ageism and all this stuff that goes on. And if you don't set yourself up as this like very knowledgeable, knowledgeable, steady player, do you think it's going to be that easy to get that job at 52 King? <laughs> no. I'm gonna look at so I'm not you look at someone's resume and go, you can't stay anywhere for a year. It's you know, you look at someone's now now you have history. Now I got 30 years of history to look at, and what picture are you painting? And it's you try to tell people there's smarter plays to make, and they always look at you like you're the dumb one. I'm like, all right, I'm dumb. I can't let this go because I feel like our listeners would appreciate it. But you made a you made a reference there to Finger Hut. You don't remember Finger Hut? Uh, I think you you told me about this. I I don't really know what it is, but it's like a um, magazine or something. No, I I grew up. You know, our family didn't. I mean, we we didn't have much money. I mean, me and my parents graduated high school. Or it was, we didn't have much much cash. And uh, you had my whole one side of my family lived in trailer parks and a big thing. And, you know, call it our neighborhood, or our community to the south of Detroit was the Finger Hut catalog and basically sold you all these things that you never needed. But maybe you wanted a blender or, or a, a Walkman, but they would give you a payment plan of like, you know, $9 a month. It was, it's kind of like layaway, but they, they would give you the thing. And it's, I guess maybe it's no different than kind of what Klarna is now and stuff, but I'm pretty sure Finger Hut still exists and they would sell you these things from Christmas lights to who knows what, but you had to make payments on it. And this is for people who basically didn't have credit or cash. Um, so that was a big thing where I grew up, where I live now. I don't, I don't think they send Finger Hut catalogs out here. <laughs> Good. We get Front Gate. We get the Front Gate catalog where they're trying to get you to buy a a door reef with a hundred lights on it for like 900 bucks. I right? like just stupid stuff. <laughs> the restoration hardware magazine in your, in your mail. It's a, it's a guilty pleasure. I do like their stuff, even though I have, gripes. <laughs> I have gripes about their quality, but stylistically I, I do like their stuff. Yeah. Speaking of, we'll move on San Francisco real estate, but there was something I told you that was very alarming. Have you processed that thought yet? Uh, uh, tell me again, please. I don't fully remember it either. So, <laughs> um, I'm, of course, ad libbing here. I listened to this thing on Friday. 
but they were talking about that building in San Francisco that the equity owner put up for auction. And I want to say they said it was going to be like $35 million, but the debt on it was thirty, oh no, $53 million. And they said Bank of America owned the note on it. So it was a $20 million hit um, on that note. And then through that like part of the conversation, you think, you know, a lot of commercial real estate might be looking at a 30 or 40% haircut. But then they said, I think they said total outstanding commercial debt on property anyways was $3 trillion. So for the fun of it, say 33%. Is there, is there a trillion dollars of losses for the banks anyways, you know, about to happen in the next 12 to 18 months? Maybe it's not that severe, but if, if they're predicting that, you know, all these commercial defaults are going to happen at a 30 or 40% um, haircut on three trillion. What does that do to the banking system? Uh, that number is just uh, it doesn't like it doesn't compute. It's so big. Put it this way: I'm I'm, I'm making up numbers again. Off the top of my head, I want to say the TARP program, the Toxic Asset Something Repurchase Plan. I don't know what the hell they called it. In 2008, it was like 700 billion. And I think that was like AIG mortgage backed securities. Like that's that was 700 billion. And I think that that affected many different things. We're talking about just commercial real estate potential trillion dollar issue. That's amazing. Amazing. I don't doubt the government would do something similar and find some kind of way to facilitate loans to get these people through. It is concerning though. Because that's just a hell of a lot of money, man. What is that as a percentage of GDP? I mean, that's that's massive. I mean, what is our budget right now? We spend six trillion. We're supposed to spend. We're taking like four trillion in in receipts, and we're spending six. Could you imagine a trillion dollar loss, and that's twenty percent of your budget? Yeah, wild. Should be twenty five percent of your budget, but very concerning. Which, you know, leads me to the bankrupt the we work bankruptcy. Which, you know, look, they they've been in trouble for a while. We've used WeWorks in what? I can't even count four states. They're they're nice for expansion, man. We're we're growing multiple companies, multiple cities. It's very convenient. I, I like the business model. There were some other places we've used in the past I didn't love. I always felt I don't know about you, but the the ones in Chicago that we had. Do you feel like they overbuilt those things out? Overbuilt? Uh, yeah. Uh, pro- I mean, if yeah, I, I'd say so. I'd say so. I mean, they were always the, like the nicest places to be relative to like the, the option or the competitive set. Have you ever seen what a linear foot of glass is for an office? No. What is it? it depends on the city, but... 100 to 300 bucks or something. Oh my God. Hey, go, I'm building an office right now in, in Michigan and we're doing some of that. And it's astronomically more in, in the city. But anytime you do that floor to ceiling glass, it's crazy expensive. The whole goddamn floor is floor to ceiling glass, man, in the, in the WeWorks. And I just, that alone made me go, holy shit, how much did they spend just on glass? And then it's, you know, the couches and the kitchens and it's a, the booths, all, all this cool stuff. They were extraordinary, but man, between the rent and these class A, class A spaces, plus this build out, holy crap. And then it gets to the point where I don't want to spend $2,000 a month for a single person office. So I, they made a joke on, uh, I, I, maybe it wasn't all in. Maybe it's something else. I thought it was all in. They go, the people that build it end up losing their ass. The second person comes through, thinking they're going to pick it up, you know, on a deal, and they're going to make money, but they end up losing their ass. And then it's the third person that comes through who ends up getting the deepest di- discount, and they're the ones that end up making the money on it. So imagine we work defaults on a Chicago office game, and this thing is completely built out. Can the landlord not turn around and sell this thing as a completely built out workspace? 
uh, that would be amazing if they would just drop like leave the keys right Do, would would they not just sell all the assets i mean whatever they could scrounge from inside i don't know i don't know I, how I, it all works i think that's probably the desk and all that stuff but i don't think you i don't think you can take down the walls if i think of like restaurants we got involved in when someone defaults on it and they leave their kitchen equipment the next person that leases that space can get a deal on the kitchen equipment i i'm you know talking way over my head but someone's going to benefit from all that money they spent like they're not you're, what are you gonna put take out the glass panels and sell them on craigslist no oh, 100 i mean if if nothing else they don't have the uh whatever the, the you know the expense sitting on their balance sheet of building the things out right so they're already at a head start but imagine if you're that building owner and so right now kane the the, the space that i'm building if i build that all out and i take off I don't have a right to to those doors and the walls and all that stuff, right? Um, someone's going to benefit. It just is it this round or the next the next time they go bankrupt? Um, cool business model. Enjoy their spaces. As it's like, man, you guys spent a lot of money, and like some at some point the unit economics didn't make sense. It's well, what are we paying like sometimes, Kane? Like six, seven hundred bucks for a single? Yes. Yeah. Five hundred bucks in a in a less desirable city. You might get a two person one for eight, nine hundred bucks. It's it's expensive. It is extremely convenient if you're expanding though. Because look, our big thing was we were expanding, doubling in size. You go to Chicago, they want a seven or ten year lease for the nice buildings. And it's like, look, man, I either gotta buy way more space than I need right now. Or I'm going to buy a space and I'm going to outgrow in 18 months. So tr traditional real estate, if you're a growing company, sucks. And that's kind of where the WeWorks and these different places came into play. I just... The founder had this like grandioso idea and he built something amazing. I just don't know if it was economically viable. Do you think that, you know, in a bankruptcy filing, if they have to just get rid of... If they get to choose the leases that are profitable for them? Like, do you think that that will look more like the city ones or the ones in the, in, uh, because I'm familiar, call it Cle like Cleveland or the, like the cities that aren't New York and Chicago? I, it's not my expertise. I don't know on that one. I, going off of what All In said, they talked about someone buying the whole thing, um, like a private equity firm would come in, buy it, offload the crap leases to say those are going bankrupt. And they put it in like three buckets. I don't remember exactly what they were talking about. Um, I think it also depends on what kind of bankruptcy you're doing and how the restructuring is. And Someone's going to win from this. There's going to be a lot of losers, probably the banks. Um, I, don't, I don't doubt there's going to be some fund that rolls through, picks this thing up. They got all the debt, you know, a lot of the debt off the books. And maybe they can make it more affordable and they actually turn this into something that can turn a margin. Yeah, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting. Yeah. What, what was your last topic here you picked up on? The last thing that they talk about is, is something that you've actually touched on a little bit, which is, and I think the this figurehead for this is Chamath, but the idea that um, is society going a, like a little bit to the right? Um, yeah, I'll let you riff on that because I think you do have a viewpoint. I mean, I, I don't, but... I, uh, I, I've only noticed it because I, sometimes, I, man, I don't trust anything anybody says anymore. You know that. Not that I ever have, but definitely not now. And I was like, you know, is I saw Chamath starting to shift, not even right. Well, you know, the whole point is if you're, if you're left and you're going towards center, then people say you become more right. I think going towards center is a better phrase than right. But I, I would say that you saw Chamath drifting more center over the last year, 18 months or so. But I've also noticed that I would say, man, from quite a few people I know that, I wouldn't say we're progressive, but definitely, definitely left. They will never be right in any sense of the word. But it's almost like that something happened at COVID and social media and society and, and everyone kind of, kind of whipsawed way over here and what i always say is almost in anything if you go back to the, what, what happened with the tea party and all that and then 
weirdly society and politics tends to whipsaw back and forth. And I said, man, if we're going this far left right now, two or three years from now, we're going to, we're probably going to whipsaw way back. And and it came for me personally. I don't want to live on either one, on either side of those extremes. Like I am personally happiest somewhere in the middle. And I was like, oh, this thing's going to whip way back over there. And then what's going to happen? And, uh, but when you start seeing, you know, minus J Cal, I mean, even Freeberg felt like he shifted a little bit towards the center and, you know, J Cal's J Cal Sachs is, it sounds like he's dug in deep, right for life. And then maybe Freeberg shifted a little bit. Chamath definitely shifted. And then you start seeing like friends and family kind of change their tune a little bit. You know, I don't want to say that it's moving right. It's I I do feel like maybe we're getting more balanced again. And I think that's maybe when we can make progress cuz look when when 50% of the country is shoving something down the other 50%'s throat, I don't think we live in a better place. And regardless of what side it is, it's just not good. It's tears this country apart. People don't get along and one side hates what happens, so then they win the next election, and then they try to undo everything the other person. It's just, that is not progress. And, God, if we can just get back to this kind of middle, level-headed way of thinking, and that, that sounds like where Chamath's going, maybe we can make some damn progress for once and actually fix some things. It's probably, that that conversation or that comment that you just made is probably a proxy for why that episode felt so peaceful. Well, J. Cal wasn't in there interrupting everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah, hey, that's it, true. It, well, you know, that's always been a pet peeve of mine. It's the two things is he'll interrupt anybody. It I hate when you mess up the flow. Let someone talk to they're done. Every once in a while, I get it. You want to cut in and in a way, sometimes cutting in keeps the thing flowing. I get that. But he just like wants to rudely interrupt all the time. And that's like some of the worst podcasts on the internet where the host just constantly just, they, ne- they never let the person finish their thought. And that's J. Cal. And then the way he's always trying to put words in Sack's mouth and try to like pin him on live video to this certain feeling or ideology. It's like, why are you trying? Are you guys friends? Cause wasn't this supposed to be for, for besties, right? Kane? Yeah, right. Yeah, they don't they don't feel like besties, right? If I felt like if someone was doing they play poker, right, in Holland. If someone was my buddy was doing that to me, you know, at a poker game, I'm I'm probably cracking you over the head with a bottle, right? It's you're that's you're not my friend right now. And I, I don't like that dynamic and I don't understand why you want to constantly try to paint someone in a corner or try to make them look bad and you mentioned before, Sachs always seemed to take it very well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, we talked about the last episode. He's, he seems always very graceful about the way he does it. It's like that one friend that keeps saying annoying shit and you're just used to him. Like, That's exactly what it is. Like, ah, you know, it's Jason being Jason. And, and then it also is like, well, that's how much they don't respect you then. So, anyways. Any closing thoughts? What's something you think that you wish they would have covered? Mm, uh, the only thing that comes to mind is there was that big uh, mass shooting again in, in Maine, I think it was. and It uh, would have been nice to hear them riff a little bit on that, but also there there are... Actually, there aren't really many bigger things. I, I'd say it would have just... It would have been nice to hear them riff on that. I think it was a big story. Um, yeah, I don't know. What about you, James? I caught... I mean, I, th- I think there's probably five things you wish they would have talked about. Um, you know, Rogan does. I don't really listen to Rogan unless the, the algorithm feeds me something. But I, I do notice his podcast for, what, three hours? Four hours? I don't, they're, yeah, they're long. They're, they're long, I, yeah. If, if, if I'm driving to Chicago and someone drops me a Spotify link and I'm like, well, this this will take care of the trip. <laughs> I'm just going to listen to this you know, Rogan podcast. And then that trip will go by fast. Maybe they should make the podcast longer. You know, we talked about, you know, do a, do a VCPE episode and then a, a politics episode or society episode. I don't know. As they, they're not trying to build this media empire. It looks like, um, so I think there's a few things I could have talked about last week. 
you know, I only, I read the headlines. I read, a, I caught a little bit on the news about the shooter. Um, the very first thing I caught on the news, on the TV news was they knew this guy had some, some signs of mental illness again. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I continue to go back to, I, I don't know about you in the last two years, I'm on a crazy people I've had to deal with out in public whether you're on a city street and an airport at a restaurant or retail shopping, it's I'm starting to get concerned that society's just losing its shit. And I, do we not have this mental health crisis going on that we do not want to deal with? And it's two things that I've seen Kane when in the shooters, you hear the word mental illness come up or that, the local law enforcement or some kind of law enforcement were aware of them. And it's like, well, if, if we were aware of them, how did we let it happen? Yeah. Why can't we be proactive about doing? Yeah, no, I, I hear you. There's, and I certainly don't have all, I don't have any of the answers. I just, I look for patterns and things and it's, you know, obviously mental illness is a problem, but what's even crazier is we keep, having these things where they heard chatter or they had some metadata or they had a run in with this person before. So they were actually aware of this person and then it happens. And then it's like, well, what, why, why couldn't we do something about it? Yeah. I don't know about where, where you are, James, but I felt like this year Halloween gatherings were, were a little light lighter than last year at least and i wonder if stuff like this has kind of a subconscious thing to it to where people just don't want to gather anymore in in the, in the volumes that they used to i mean there's still obviously our gatherings i mean i do I, to be honest i was hoping that halloween was making a resurgent i love halloween it is always very enjoyable i you know the duality i love halloween and christmas you can like both believe it or not um <laughs> And I felt like it was starting to get a little more steam, and then this year it, it it did feel like it fell off a little bit. And when I was little, you couldn't, you know, we'd get a pillowcase. I lived in these six like, seven hundred square foot baby boomer roll houses, so you know, fifty million houses and in, in this little square amount, you could just run from six till nine o'clock and fill a pillowcase up, and the streets were just full of kids trying to stuff their bags full, and you drive around, and you just don't see, you didn't see the kids this year, so. I, but I do know personally people that have stopped even going to like gyms and even some events because of what's going on in the Middle East right now. They they don't feel comfortable being in um, public places where there might be a lot of people. And uh, yeah. that's, you know, the last you know month or so, whatever, since October 7th, 8th, when it happened. Uh, whether or not it affected Halloween, I don't know. But I, I do know people that have said that they have been avoiding places like that just in particular and <sighs> crazy times man i don't we're gonna see what's gonna happen in the next 12 months let's hope it all calms down let's yes. let's hope let's hope we don't let's let's hope for the soft landing let's let's hope commercial real estate doesn't crash we get some some peace in in europe and the middle east and and it's you always dream it doesn't go on back to boom times and opportunity and I feel like, unfortunately, I feel like we're far away away from that, but it will come again. Yeah, yeah, I'm optimistic too. So, yeah. Anyways, it's uh, what's the we gotta do an episode on the book? What's chapter three? Do you know off the top of your head? Not off the top of my head, unfortunately. I uh, I'll have to go look that up. Yeah, we'll try to get chapter three done for the channel here, uh, maybe tomorrow. And funny part is, like, people keep asking me all these questions. They're, they're these all these people wrote the read the book now. And they're sending me messages on like Instagram and crap. And can I don't remember writing half that stuff. <laughs> like I, I read it, I read it and I go, that is something I would write. But you know, at least for me anyways, how I just blurt all this stuff out. And then it's like, I, I know I wrote that. I just don't remember it. And uh, it, it's kind of cool. Cause people are like posting quotes, you know, on their stories and I'm, they're sending me like shots of the clips and, very exciting but if you ask me what chapter three was about right now i don't i don't know so yeah no the, the response sorry james go ahead oh good the response to the book's been nice because i i know people who who are 
cynical business book readers. I mean, people that I know who just despise business books have, have pinged me and said, yeah, they, it's good. Um, and it, it's, it's because of that deal perspective thing. So I think we, we made a good decision doing that. So far, you know, from the hey, 15, 20 people that I don't know that sent messages out, they really enjoyed that because it really is the best of both worlds. It's, I'm sure someone else has done it, but I, I think, or at least I hope we executed it well, where it, it keeps the book moving and really giving you two insights. It's almost like reading two books at once. And, uh, Hopefully that helps people walk away with some insights. But um, as soon as we figure out what the hell chapter three was, let's let's record that one and, and get it up. For sure. So, all right. Well, I'll catch you till next one. Bye.